we're all busy people. And when you're busy, you tend to put off fun for later. We've certainly done that, prioritizing calls with sources or script writing over taking a relaxing break. But one thing that helps us break that burnout-inducing habit is Best Fiends. This is a delightful mobile puzzle adventure game, and it's the perfect pastime to help you break out of the doldrums. We are both obsessed with this game, which pits a squad of quirky, freedom-loving bugs against a horde of autocratic slugs. Whenever we have some downtime, like we're stuck in line or waiting on a call, or just taking a break after editing together an episode, we can knock out a level or two. We sometimes have to travel far and wide for our journalism, so it's nice to be able to play offline, even when we're in an area with iffy internet. There's nothing better than getting on a roll and picking up tools to help in the quest to defeat the slugs. It's a nice mental break to take your mind off work and stress. Anya is on level 995. Kevin is on level 262. It's frankly getting embarrassing. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Content Warning This episode contains discussion of murder, violence against women, rape, and misogyny. This wasn't like her. 28-year-old Roseanne Quinn was dedicated to her job. She worked in the Bronx as a teacher at New York City's St. Joseph School for the Deaf. She was the sort of teacher who'd bring breakfast in for her kids because some of them got up too early to eat at home. She would often stay after school, too, doing what she could to help out her students. Even when she wasn't at the school, she seemed to remain focused on her work. She was attending night classes at Hunter College and had already completed half her work for a master's degree in teaching children with hearing loss. It seemed very much like she wanted to dedicate the rest of her life to educating those with hearing disabilities. Perhaps part of the reason why she felt such a passion for the work is that she herself knew what it was like to be isolated for being different. When she was a teenager, she'd suffered from polio and spent much time in the hospital. Even now, she walked with a bit of a limp. A woman like that wouldn't miss work without a good reason. And yet, she did not show up at the school on January 2nd, 1973, the first day of classes after the holiday break. She didn't even bother to call to explain why. She didn't come to St. Joseph the next day either, so the school decided to send someone over to her apartment to try to figure out what was going on. The superintendent of the building, Amedio Gizzo, agreed to open up Roseanne's room. The first thing they noticed was the blood. The walls were splattered with it. And then they found Roseanne. She was lying nude on her bed, face up. She'd been beaten and punched in her face. One of the weapons used, oddly enough, was a 65-pound bust of herself, which an artist friend of hers had created. But it appeared as if she had been struck with that after she was already dead. She had been bitten, too. There were tooth marks on her body. And she had been stabbed. Eighteen times. Twelve times in the neck and six times in the stomach. Near her corpse lay a pair of books, Speech and Hearing Science, and Talk to the Deaf. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. 
We're at the murder sheet, and this is Looking for Roseanne Quinn. Sometimes when a person is killed, it is barely noticed. More often, those left behind grieve and mourn and try to honor the memory of the person they have lost. But sometimes, the aftermath of a murder reaches out far beyond those who knew the victim. Sometimes, it affects the entire country. This is what happened to Roseanne Quinn. But not at first. In the beginning, the press concentrated on how well-liked she was. She was a friendly, pleasing personality, a St. Joseph spokesman told the Daily News, not only with the children, but also with the other teachers. And it wasn't just her professional colleagues who sung her praises. Al Press, a dry cleaner whose place was near Roseanne's apartment, contrasted her with some of the other people he saw in the area. We get some weird people around here, he told the Daily News. But this girl was different. She was very nice and quiet and shy. She wore skirts and blouses, not this hippie stuff. I remember once I said, Hello, Miss Quinn, and she seemed taken aback that I should remember her name. The idea of her being a nice girl in a strange area briefly took hold. It was noted that the neighborhood she lived in was near an area of Broadway where drugs were sold so openly it was called Needle Park. In fact, in a horrible coincidence, a year earlier, another teacher, a woman named Patrice Leary, had been beaten to death in her apartment that was just a short walk away from where Quinn died. At that time, Homicide Squad Commander Lieutenant Jean McDermott made a point of telling the Daily News that Leary was not a trollop or junkie. This girl, Miss Leary, she represents total innocence. For some reason, it seemed important to everyone that the female victim be innocent, unsullied by any taint of drugs or sex. And so, when Roseanne's body showed obvious signs that she had recently had sex, everyone appeared to assume she had been raped. But there were a couple of problems with this theory. There was not any physical evidence of forcible rape, nor were there any signs that the killer had forced his way into Roseanne's apartment. The implication seemed clear. Roseanne had let her killer into her apartment and had then chosen to have sex with him. Reporters and police investigated and soon revealed that sometimes Roseanne would go to area bars with her dates. On other occasions, she would meet a man for the first time at the bar and then invite him to go back to her apartment. For some, these revelations seemed quite lurid and even baffling. Roseanne helped the deaf and seemed like a good girl. So how could she possibly enjoy casual sex? And could this mean that other good girls were also out there picking up men? The press started running stories playing up the great dangers faced by these so-called bachelor girls and the risks they took by trying to live as freely as men. The only advice I have for a single woman, Lieutenant Julia Tucker of the New York City Rape Squad told the New York Times, is that she should avoid being alone in any area of the city. Police took the Roseanne Quinn homicide investigation quite seriously assigning 20 to 40 detectives to the case. The officers interviewed hundreds of her friends, and they got results. Multiple people reported seeing Roseanne on the night of January 1st. She was at a bar called William Tweed's, which was just across the street from her apartment. 
Some people said they spotted her there with two men, but no one seemed to recognize either of them. One of the men left the bar alone at 11 p.m. The other remained behind with Roseanne, ultimately leaving with her. No one seemed able to give a very clear description of that man, but the police were able to create a sketch of the first man, the one who left Tweeds early. They released that sketch to the media, choosing their words carefully. The man in the image, they said, was not actually a suspect, but just someone they felt could shed some light on the investigation. And then they went out into the neighborhood, knocking on doors and ringing bells in order to put the sketch in front of someone who could identify him. The strategy paid off. Before long, the police got a call from a person who admitted that he was the man in the sketch. He had recognized himself when he saw the image in the press. On the advice of his attorney, he decided to contact the police and offer to reveal everything he knew in exchange for full immunity. The man's name was Geary Guest. He was 42 years old and he worked in advertising. After his immunity deal was worked out, the police headed over to his apartment to talk with him. Guest explained that a few years earlier, while walking through Times Square, he came across a man in his early 20s named John Wayne Wilson. The two hit it off and soon returned to Guest's place to have sex. The pair remained close. Wilson went on to marry a woman in Florida, but by the fall of 1972, he was back living with Guest in New York City. On the night of January 1st, the men went out to dinner together and, on a whim, on the way home, stopped by a bar called William Tweed's. That is where they met Roseanne Quinn. After a while, Guest grew tired and decided to go home. Wilson stayed behind with Roseanne. Guest would not learn what happened next until later that night, when Wilson told him the whole story. Roseanne and Wilson got along well at the bar. One thing led to another, and eventually Wilson and Roseanne went across the way to Roseanne's apartment. They smoked some marijuana and began to make out. Things were going great until they started to undress to have sex. Wilson was wearing a pair of women's panties. Maybe that embarrassed him a bit, but his problems grew even worse after he slipped the garment off. He was unable to perform sexually. He imagined that it was because he'd had too much to drink, and he tried to explain that to Roseanne. But, at least according to Wilson, she was not understanding. She said that Wilson wasn't really a man and told him to leave. Instead, the enraged Wilson attacked her, hitting her and beating her and biting her and stabbing her again and again and again. Something about this act and how he took the life away from this beautiful young woman got to him and he found he was now able to perform. And so he had sex with her dead body. When he was done, he took the bust someone had made of Roseanne and he hit her with it. Afterwards, he showered and then used her white slip to carefully wipe away any fingerprints he may have left in the apartment. Content in the knowledge that he was safe, he went back to Geary Guest's place, confessed everything, and then fell asleep. Have you ever wondered what you would do if a friend or a roommate admitted to you that they had just committed a murder? Perhaps you would go immediately to the police, or at the very least, urge your friend to do so. But Guest did not do either of those things. When Wilson woke up the next day, Guest gave him money and told him to get out of town. Wilson did so. First, he went down to Florida to visit his pregnant wife. Then he headed to his family in Indiana. At every stop along the way, he called Guest to tell him where he was and what he was doing. By a freakish coincidence, Wilson actually called Guest while the police were there. And Wilson even mentioned that he was staying in his brother's apartment in Indianapolis. The police, naturally, got on the next flight they could to Indiana. 
There was nothing like listening to a true crime podcast late at night and then rushing to make sure all your doors and windows are locked. We've definitely been there. But these days, we feel much less worried about our safety thanks to our Simply Safe home security system. And the nice thing about Simply Safe is that they're flexible and affordable without compromising their service. It's Simply Safe, your safety is the number one concern. But they're offering top notch services for an affordable price. And our listeners will get a special deal on 40% off their advanced security system. Back when we lived in a tiny apartment in Brooklyn, we could have really used this Simply Safe system. It doesn't require any drilling, so it's perfect for renters. Today, we love being able to check into our system via an app on our phones. It's great to be able to monitor our crystal clear HD live streams of our security cameras. It makes us feel like we're taking charge of our own safety. Don't miss this chance to save big when you protect your home with the best. Get 40% off your order when you visit simplysafe.com slash msheet today. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes. That's simplysafe.com dot com slash m sheet. There's no safe like simply safe. Digging into upsetting crimes can be stressful. That's why we're so grateful for our sponsor Tanasi. This company has created a full range of science backed products to help you achieve calmness, relief, and rest. The secret is a CBD plus CBDA formula that's twice as good as CBD alone. Researchers found that the CBD plus CBDA formula was superior when it came to suppressing inflammation. I love putting Tanasi's lotion on my hands and neck. It makes me feel more relaxed and is now a key part of my bedtime routine. We've enjoyed trying out Tanasi's line of soft gels, lotions, and tinctures. We feel that since we've started, we've been having an easier time with falling asleep and with aches and pains. We appreciate that Tanasi products are all third-party tested to ensure they're potent and pure, and we've loved our results. We also love that Tanasi sticks by its products. If you try your Tanasi products for 30 days and you're not loving the results, they'll give you a full refund. Go to Tanasi.com and use code MSHEET to get 50% off at checkout. That's T-A-N-A-S-I dot com to get 50% off your first order with promo code MSHEET. Statements regarding efficacy and safety have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any disease. The police moved quickly and so made it to Indianapolis to get Wilson on January 9th, 1973, just over a week after the murder. Wilson did not seem terribly surprised to see them. He consented to the arrest without a fight and was soon on his way back to New York to face justice. I stood him up and I read him his rights, New York City Detective Thomas Lafferty told the New York Times. I talked to him in the apartment and I talked to him on the way back on the plane. All that time I was waiting for him to say, I'm sorry I killed her. He never said it. That still bothers me. When we started researching this case, we had no idea that Wilson came from Indiana. His first marriage was even reported on in my hometown newspaper, the Columbus Republic. To satisfy my curiosity, I couldn't help but visit the neighborhood where Wilson stayed when he was arrested. It's a pleasant area with tree-lined streets and beautiful old buildings. The house where former President Benjamin Harrison lived is a short walk away. As I strolled along, I couldn't help but think that this was a perfect place for Wilson to be arrested. There was a lawyer's office next door to his brother's apartment building, and just down the street there was a mental health advocacy organization. Because, not surprisingly, Wilson's attorneys soon signaled that they planned to use an insanity defense. It wasn't as if they had much of a choice. Wilson had readily confessed to the crime, and so they could not argue that he was innocent. It was even possible that Wilson might be called to account for another murder. This one happened in Florida, where Wilson's wife lived. In October 1972, 
Just months before Roseanne was killed, 43-year-old Joan Catlett Beam went missing after being seen leaving a Miami Beach bar with a man. Shortly thereafter, her nude body was found in her hotel room. She had been beaten and stabbed 11 times. The witnesses who saw Joan at the bar on the last night of her life contacted police after seeing news stories about Wilson's arrest for killing Roseanne. They recognized him. He was the man they had seen her leave with. He was therefore quite possibly the man who had beaten and stabbed her, much as he would soon beat and stab Roseanne. Considering all of that, about all that was left for Wilson's attorneys to argue was that he could not be held fully accountable for the murder because he was insane. The first step in building that defense was to have him examined by doctors. After he was given some tests at Bellevue Hospital, Wilson was left in a cell that was not carefully watched. He seized the opportunity to hang himself, making a noose out of torn bed sheets and looping them in the ceiling ventilation holes. The date was May 5, 1973. Roseanne Quinn had been dead for just over four months. With her killer now dead as well, it would seem as if the story of her murder had come to an end. But actually, it was just the beginning. This was due largely to a writer named Judith Rosner, who was interested in the case. When Nora Ephron asked her if she wanted to do an article for Esquire, Rosner enthusiastically pitched a nonfiction piece on the murder. The case fascinated Rosner because she couldn't quite figure Roseanne out. How could a respected Catholic school teacher be leading a social life that was, at least in Rosner's view, squalid? Could it be possible that she was somehow looking for her own death? Rosner's approach must have scared off Esquire's lawyers. They killed the story. But this didn't bother Rosner too much. I said fine, she later told the Washington Post. I'm a lousy journalist anyway, which I am. I have the absolute urge to bend reality to my own needs. The facts are my enemy, so I figured I'd do it as a novel. And that's exactly what she did, writing a novel loosely based on the case called Looking for Mr. Goodbar. People, of course, have fictionalized real events for centuries, and there's nothing especially wrong with that. The problem here is that Rosner stayed just close enough to the truth so that unwary readers began to confuse her fictional character, Teresa Dunn, with the actual Roseanne Quinn. That, combined with Rosner's all but explicit condemnation of the lifestyle led by young single women in New York, made for a potent brew. The novel became a bestseller. In Rosner's book, John Wayne Wilson was rather unimaginably renamed Gary Cooper White, and Roseanne Quinn became Teresa Dunn. Despite the fact that her protagonist had a name similar to Roseanne's, and the same job as Roseanne, and died like Roseanne, Rosner always stressed that her story was only inspired by Roseanne, and indicated that she had not researched it as a journalist would. Instead, she used her imagination to create so-called emotional equivalents. Here's an example. Do you remember how Roseanne suffered from polio as a child, which left her with a limp? Well, Teresa had a limp too. And Rosner felt this limp was the key to her whole character, something that made her feel flawed something that made her go through her whole life with such low self-esteem that it made her indulge in destructive behavior. And by destructive behavior, we mean the character had a sex life. Rosner went so far as to suggest to the Times of San Mateo that Teresa's murder was collaborative, as if a woman's desire to have sex somehow suggests that she enters into a conspiracy to commit her own murder. Early death, said Rosner, is another romantic fantasy. She had harsh words for Teresa's lifestyle. It's not a question of morality, right or wrong, but whether going into a singles bar will make a woman feel any better. I don't want to be preachy, but it is a bad scene. 
Rosner's novel was such a sensation that it was swiftly adapted into a movie, written and directed by Richard Brooks. Unlike Rosner, Brooks boasted of the research he did. Not only did he read and reread the novel, but he spent six months traveling to singles bars all over the country and claimed to have interviewed 600 women. His efforts seemed to result in little more than moralistic declarations. This woman, Teresa, he said, is a dual personality. Her problem is that she mistakes sexual freedom for women's liberation. That sort of thinking seemed very much at the heart of Goodbar. The movie does make moral judgments about the victim, wrote Ellen Amon of the Lexington Herald Leader. Brooks's adaptation acts to indicate that Teresa conspires in her own slaying. That's one interpretation, but another is this. Random violence is just that, random, patternless, motiveless, insofar as the victim is concerned. After all is said and done, Teresa invited the man home to sleep with her, not to kill her. Modern commentators have also picked up on what they see as Good Bar's implicit suggestion that it is dangerous or self-destructive for a woman to enjoy sexual freedoms. Writing in Slate, Jude Ellison Sadie Doyle said that they see a simple message in the story. Young women plus sex equals excess, and excess equals misery. Something is out of joint with the girls today. They've gotten out of control, and it has to end badly. Maybe what scares us isn't the girls are putting themselves in danger. Maybe what scares us is simply the fact that they're putting themselves out in the world at all. Like all good horror stories and all fairy tales, Goodbar boils a common fear down to its bare outline. A young woman has sex. She likes it. Because she likes it, none of the rewards we offer for good behavior, marriage or children or love, matter anymore. She goes out into the woods alone and does not heed her mother's warnings. She finds a monster in her bed, and he eats her up. What's lost in all of this, of course, is Roseanne Quinn. No matter what the unwary reader might think, Teresa Dunn is not Roseanne. Through Rosner's fiction, we may come to know Teresa but the real person behind her remains a cipher. For a while, though, it looked as if that might change and Roseanne would finally get her due. A former New York Times reporter named Lacey Fosberg published Closing Time, a book which purported to be the true story of the Goodbar murder. But there were problems. The first is, it wasn't true at all. Fosberg changed names and identifying details. So, in this true story, Roseanne Quinn becomes a woman named Catherine Cleary, and John Wayne Wilson becomes a man named Joe Willie Simpson. Worse yet, Fosberg gave herself what she called the liberty to go beyond proven fact. Since she doesn't clearly cite sources, this means it is all but impossible to discern what in her book is fact and what is fiction. Another issue with the book is that Roseanne's family and close friends did not talk to Fosberg. As the reporter admitted, I know there is more to Catherine Cleary than I was able to discover. But this did not stop her from making up all sorts of things about Roseanne and drawing conclusions about her. As she told the Los Angeles Times, She could never get her personal life together. The key question is loneliness. She was unable to create intimacy. It wasn't true all along, but it became more clear as she got older. I don't think the real woman liked sex. Although you can never really know without asking. I think it was almost like compulsive eating for her. Fosberg even went so far as to suggest the real Roseanne might not have been worth hanging out with. She may not have been the most interesting person to sit down and talk to over lunch. But in terms of what she represents and evokes about women and about life, in that sense, I think she's profound. But again, Roseanne Quinn was not a symbol or a representation 
and she was not even a character named Teresa Dunn or Catherine Cleary. She was a real woman with hopes and dreams who had her life snuffed out by a violent man. The fictions of writers like Rosner and Fosberg only obscure Roseanne in layers of fog, making the true details of her and her life increasingly difficult to discern. As an example of this, let's look at an actual incident in Roseanne's story and how different sources have related it. Sometime in spring of 1972, a man hit her. Roseanne reported the assault to the police, and charges were filed against the man, but they ended up being dropped. The press reports after her death alluded to this event, but they did not give much detail about it. The rumor at the time was that the man hit her because she rejected his sexual advances. In this version, then, Roseanne was an innocent victim. Things were a bit different in the version that appears in Closing Time. In this iteration, Roseanne got interested in Freddie Watson, an unemployed African-American man Fosberg said was dangerous with an overwhelming fascination with guns. This so-called sick and twisted man had a reputation in the neighborhood, but yet Roseanne let him buy her a drink at William Tweed's. Shortly thereafter, she took him to her apartment. A few hours passed, and the neighbors reported hearing yells and screams. Investigating, they found Freddie in the hallway, shouting obscenities. Roseanne was in her apartment, welts and bruises on her shoulders. The neighbor told Roseanne she should not be with a man like that, and Roseanne agreed. The next day, Roseanne reported the beating to the police. Freddie ultimately got arrested and charged, but a judge dismissed the charges. Meanwhile, the incident seemed to change Roseanne, waking up something inside her, according to the book. Her neighbor started hearing crashes and other loud noises in her apartment more often, but they stopped interfering. It was what she wanted, said the neighbor. I guess it was some kind of rough sex. Some people get off on that and she must have had to be raped or kicked around or something to feel any excitement or thrill. So, in that version, Quinn still comes off as a bit of a victim. She naively took a dangerous man into her apartment and suffered a beating because of it. The man clearly should not have beaten her, but she, it is implied, bears a share of the responsibility because she chose to take him to her bed. Instead of learning a lesson, she persisted in that sort of behavior because it gave her pleasure. This, it is implicitly suggested, led to her death. By knowingly inviting risky men to her apartment for sex, she essentially played Russian roulette and, by that line of thinking, brought her death on herself. There is still another version of the incident, this one appearing in the 100 Kilo case, a recent memoir that former New York detective Peter Daly wrote in collaboration with James Durney. Before we begin Daly's version, we should note that he later served time in prison on corruption and drug charges. He also gets Roseanne's name wrong, calling her Joanne Quinn. These things should influence how much credibility we should give him. According to Daly, he was the investigator who took Joanne Quinn's complaint that she had been beaten. But, in Daly's account, her charges went beyond that. She had also been raped. Daly was skeptical of her claim, warning her of the trouble she could get in for filing a false police report. But she insisted her story was true, and then left. She returned to the police station a couple of days later, carrying a New York State driver's license she had found under her bed. The man who raped her must have dropped it somehow. The license, of course, had his name and picture. It identified him as an African-American man named Leroy Gibson. The police tracked him down and Daly spoke with him. Note that the name has changed from what we've heard in the previous version of the incident. We have no idea what this man's name was or even if he actually existed. 
Either way, Daly wrote that he found himself impressed with Gibson. The detective described the suspect as unemployed but clean, well-dressed, and quite articulate. Side note, isn't that always a sign that a white person is racist, when they're impressed by a person of color being quote-unquote clean and articulate? Anyways, Daly thought Gibson seemed like a good guy, and Gibson gave Daly his own version of events. According to Gibson, he met Quinn at a bar. They hit it off and soon went to her room. The moment the door closed behind them, she started groping him and talking dirty. They had sex. Lots of sex. When the alarm woke them the next morning, they had sex again. She then told him that she needed to get to work, but she gave him a set of keys to her place and said she really wanted him to still be there when she got back that afternoon. He was welcome to help himself to any food in the fridge. She gave him a goodbye kiss and then rushed off to her teaching job. Naturally, Gibson hung around. He ended up staying at her place for three days before he finally told her it was time for him to leave and get back to his own apartment. That annoyed her. She wanted him to stay. So she grabbed his wallet with all of his money and hid it somewhere in her room, a desperate gambit to convince him not to go. He left anyway, but he soon returned for his money. But Quinn would not give it back. He pleaded with her, even said he would do anything she wanted. He just needed to go back to his apartment sometimes as he had other commitments. She still refused to return his cash. And that is when he hit her. It started a bit of a fight. The couple struggled. The physical confrontation excited her. It got her in the mood. And she wanted sex again. Gibson said he ended up getting out of there with his money, but that a vengeful Quinn reported him to the police for hitting her. Gibson's story, in short, was that Quinn essentially wanted to keep him hostage in her apartment as a sex slave that she provoked a fight because it turned her on, and that she gave his name to police basically out of pique. Peter Daly thought that tale sounded pretty compelling and believable. He ended up speaking to the female assistant district attorney handling the case. Daly told her he did not believe Quinn's story. This helped convince the ADA to drop all of the charges against Gibson. Daly concludes his account by noting that he thought Joanne the target of an assault who would later be murdered, was a dangerous woman. In Daly's view, she liked to push buttons, and that if she continued to do so, then surely someday someone would end up seriously hurting her. In other words, she was asking for it and got what she deserved. She had been transformed from the victim of a crime into the architect of all her misfortunes, fully responsible for her awful fate. What relation, if any, the Joanne of Daly's story has to the real Roseanne is very difficult to discern. The writers we have discussed in this episode did not seem terribly interested in the life of Roseanne Quinn, an actual woman who devoted herself to working with those with special needs. Instead, they created fictional versions of her in order to titillate the public while delivering alarmist and moralistic messages about the dangers of sex. None of them seem too concerned with the issue of violent men, though. John Wayne Wilson attacked Roseanne with a bust of herself. These writers assault her memory with lurid tales about Joanne Quinn or Catherine Cleary or Teresa Dunn. Both acts in some way seek to replace an inconveniently complex real person with something quite imaginary. Roseanne Quinn and those who loved her deserved better. The murder of Roseanne Quinn and the cultural phenomenon of looking for Mr. Goodbar has been extensively covered in the media. The New York Daily News did standout work on this case, and we were especially impressed with the work of their reporters, Sidney Fields, Frank Fazzo, Philip McCarthy, Anthony Burton, John Rendazzo, and Henry Lee. The New York Times also covered this story quite well, and we would like to especially single out the work there by Michael T. Kaufman. 
We also relied on coverage that appeared in the News of Patterson, New Jersey, the Herald News of Passaic, New Jersey, the Columbus, Indiana Republic, the Indianapolis News, the AP, the Pittsburgh Press, Newsday, the Times of San Mateo, the Tampa Tribune, the Miami News, the Philadelphia Daily News, the Rushville Republican, the Chicago Tribune, the Charlotte Observer, the Los Angeles Times, the Dayton Daily News, the Arizona Daily Star, the Courier Journal, the Sacramento Bee, and the Washington Post. NakedCitySTories.com has a useful overview of the case, though it does mistakenly say that Wilson was from Illinois instead of Indiana. It probably got that information from Closing Time by Lacey Fosberg. As we mentioned, the author of that book freely admitted that her book included fictional elements. For that reason, we consider it a bad idea to rely on the book as a source for what truly happened in the case. It's a mystery to us why no one has ever written a truly comprehensive and accurate book about Roseanne's life and death that tells it all straight, with no changed names or details or embellishments. Her story deserves to be told. We also consulted The 100 Kilo Case, a book by the late Peter Daly with James Durney. We were impressed with some sharp commentary on Goodbar that Ellen Amon wrote for the Lexington Herald Leader back in the 1970s, and that Jude Ellison Sadie Doyle wrote more recently for Slate. If you're interested, the movie version of Looking for Mr. Goodbar is available on YouTube. It may be worth a look, if only as a cultural curiosity. The somewhat more accurate track down, Finding the Goodbar Killer, a 1983 television movie is also available on YouTube. It focuses on the police work that led to the swift arrest of Wilson. But it, like so much else of the coverage of this case, contains many, many, many fictional elements and so should not be relied on. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on the Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at MSheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to the Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.